Well, welcome to 22nd Century Management with Ken. It's nice to have you with us today. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion. I'm very fortunate to have with me Paul, uh, Paula Calgary, and she is an award-winning author, a distinguished academic, and a leading expert in cultural agility. And she offers proven research back uh, approaches to help professionals succeed and thrive in any country. And so we're gonna talk about cultural agility, why it's important, in particularly in the Zoom era, because we wind up, uh, orders become less meaningful now. So Paul, you wanna tell us a little more about your background? Absolutely, Ken, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, yeah, so as uh, you noted, I, I'm my area of expertise in cultural agility. I'm a university professor at Northeastern University in Boston over in the business school. And I'm also the president of a company called Skillify, um, which is a public benefit corporation designed to help people be more comfortable working across cultures, across generations, across professions, wherever we have to work in a multicultural environment. So uh, have it, it's keeping me busy. Okay, well, very nice. Uh, I'm glad to have you on today. So let's start with the, the, the question of probably a lot of the audience. And by the way, if you, wherever you're listening from in the comments, let us know where, where in the world you're listening to the show from. I had people signed up for the show that are from pretty much all over the world. So just if you would in the comments, put where you're watching from. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's start with what is cultural agility? Sure. So cultural agility is the ability to comfortably and effectively work in different countries, as you mentioned, but also people from different cultures. And those cultures could be, as I mentioned, it could be um, multi-generational, it could be racial, it could be gender, uh, and of course, you know, cultural, national culture. So yeah. broadly defined. Yeah, and it's really interesting because one of the things that I talk in, in my uh, service management training course that I put on, we talked about with uh, as part of the first semester, is I went through on the different generations and the generations, you know, the baby boomers, the traditionalists, Gen Y, Gen Z, because understanding the differences in those generations uh, will affect how you manage them, how you try to hire them. And it's really important that we understand things like that. It, absolutely. It's basically any situation where, where we're, uh, you know, subjectively looking at a, a scene, a situation, an interaction, a conversation, and we're using our lenses to make a subjective judgment about the other. Um, so anytime we're in that situation, we need cultural agility. It's critical. Okay, so is um, that a, a competency that we can develop or is it a trait that we're born with? Is it something that's oh. just innate in us? <laughs> yeah, without question. It is something we can develop and do we ever need it now more than ever? Um, it is there, you know, there is a little bit of nature involved in it. Um, some, to some extent, the way our bodies handle serotonin and dopamine will affect what we're like when we're in a novel environment, when we're in a new situation. So that to some extent has a little bit to do with it, but so much of cultural agility is built through, you know, developing out those competencies and having some experiences and practicing skills. Um, it, it's, it's definitely one that we can move the needle on. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting. I've had a chance to uh, travel a lot. I lived around the world. I lived for a while in Japan, and it was interesting. And I, uh, I'll share an example of somebody that didn't have cultural agility. Um, when we were in Japan, my wife and I were in a store, and I had never really understood the term "ugly American" until this incident. But we were in a Japanese store where they sold china. And we were looking at China and a couple of GIs came in and I was in the military at the time. And, and they started talking to the clerk and he was a little busy doing something. And so they just started talking slower and louder and slower and louder. <laughs> like everybody will eventually speak English if you slow enough and loud enough. And he just looked at him. And, and it was really funny because this, this kind of, I think goes to the point a little bit. Is when they left, I walked over and I said, Ohio oh, gozaimasu, which is good morning. And he says, oh, hi, how are you doing? in English. He spoke perfect English, but you know, he didn't speak English to those two guys because he just didn't want them as customers. He, he <laughs> or it could have been that he just really didn't understand. You're right. Louder and louder and slower is not, uh, not going to change comprehension. But yeah, yeah. usually okay, anything so, he can do to make connection is good. Yeah. Um, uh, he said, it's just interesting people. 
I, I love watching people the way the things they do. Um, you know, it's 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 an interesting part of life. Okay, so in in business, who really needs cultural agility? Yeah. It is so critical for anyone in a situation where you need to establish trust, credibility, you need to communicate effectively, you need to collaborate across a group. So, so any of those four are situations where it is a strategic necessity for individuals to have cultural agility. Um, I, I see this a lot, you know, especially people don't think about it, but sales, customer service, leadership, um, situations where, you know, operations, any kind of, you know, management roles are really critical. Any kind of innovation or product teams need cultural agility, anything where we're working together. Trust, credibility, communication, collaboration, all of them are so critical. Yeah, and, and I can see that because, again, I am and being from, you know, uh, a, a baby boomer, there are things that we brought with us culturally coming out of, you know, uh, you know, in that time frame, that sometimes are hard to get away with, or hard to get away from, I should say. They think, you know, um, I, I typically work with technicians, and sometimes I will use, the, you know, your your technicians. You can tell tell him to do this. Well, a technician doesn't have to be a, a, a gentleman; it could be a lady. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that would be a. Let me see if I'm correct. That would be a case of being culturally insensitive. <laughs> oh, I don't talk about sensitive and sensitive. I think you were socialized in your reality where a lot of technicians were in fact male. So your brain sort of processes technician equal male, um, you know, but again, that's sort of the slow down the processor behaviorally respect that, hey, you know what, it, it could he or she could da 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 da. Um, I'm, a, I'm an older Gen Xer and I think I am at 54, yeah, older Gen Xer. And I, I, I'm getting tripped up on the using they as a pronoun. I, I'm okay with the he or she, him or her, <laughs> but they or them. It's just it was just the way I was socialized. Almost it was like my grammar rule won't let me do it. But it's just a little different. Yeah, I, and I understand. And, and it's interesting on Twitter. I see that a lot. You know that people will put the, their choice of pronoun after right. their name or in their description. You know, and I'm like, okay. You know, it's it's and it's just again it's different from what we grew up with but it, and it's, you know, it's actually beautiful because people can be referred to as they want it's just that we, we're all socialized a little differently and i think more than anything what i'm sensing in this climate that we have to remember is people are sincerely good they are in their heart we don't want to offend each other we do want to build relationship and build trust and, and show compassion for one another um and that I think I think we all need to give each other a little bit of break, a little bit of a break with some cultural agility and understanding that kind of considering each other with positive regard. It's a really good first step. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So how is it that we work on developing cultural agility? Yeah. Maybe it's maybe I should say how do we break our old molds? Sure. Um, I'm actually going to share something because it's so pervasive right now. So I'm going to I'm going to going to do what I tell my students not to do. And I'm going to start with what not to do. So unfortunately, right now, across so many organizations around the world, we're seeing company after company roll out unconscious bias training. And it is breaking my heart when I see so many, so many resources, time and money um, being generated with that activity, because the fundamental piece of cultural agility is helping us find similarity with one another as quickly as we can, as comfortably as we can, as authentically as we can, find some something that would connect us, something on which we're similar, and then build from there. What unconscious bias training does, it's having the opposite effect. It's putting a massive spotlight on our differences. And it's also sort of just underscoring the fact that we've got we've got functioning brains. Anyone with a functioning brain is going to have some kind of, it's not even a bias. It's just the data you've been collecting, stored, and being recalled in one-tenth of a second. That's all that is. It's not a bias. So in calling it, calling it that, we're sort yeah. of limiting our natural and authentic conversations. So for me, rule number one with, with, with um, cultural agility development is learn the skill, build the skill, 
of how to find similarity. And then we have in the book, we have lots of great ways to do that. But um, but but oh, if I had one wish for companies is that they would they would refocus their energy away from unconscious bias training and onto cultural agility training. Okay, so so it's okay to be who we are. It's just we need to modify how we interact with others and accept others the way they are. Yeah, I, I think so, so. It's the idea of saying, look, at, let, let's let's stop focusing on how we're different. Let's let's put a focus on how we're how we're similar. And remember that we all have functioning limbic systems. Let's just start there, okay? So so we're going to in any situation that's novel, new company, new team, new you're working with people from a different generation, you're traveling for work, whatever it is. Anytime you walk into a situation, there's going to be rules and norms and and some things that your your eyeballs will will be will be interpreting through your brain that might not be accurate. So part of cultural agility is recognizing, sort of slowing it down, tolerating the ambiguity of not saying, I can certainly interpret this. I can interpret the situation. I know what's going on. You don't. No matter how good you are. So having tolerance for ambiguity, having humility. So humility, that ability to say, I'm a fantastic physician, biologist, journalist, you know, strategy expert, finance consultant, whatever you are, I'm great at what I do, but I don't know how to do it here. So to be able to say comfortably, help me learn how to be more effective in this environment, um, breathing it through. So, so tolerance for ambiguity is a competency. Humility is a competency. There's, there's a lot of them, but, but again, every one of them can be developed. You know, it's interesting what you, what you said just triggered it. I use it with my sister. She has some, uh, she, she doesn't understand why people do things they do sometimes. And and I, I use this analogy with it. I think it's appropriate. It's kind of like we all wear a set of broken glasses and everybody's glasses are broken differently. <laughs> and, and so the way we see the world through our broken glasses is different than the way they see the world through their broken glasses. Neither of them are 100% correct, but it's just the way we see the world and the way we respond to it. Does that sound like a fair? Yeah, it's a beautiful way to describe it, but especially when we're all walking around thinking that our, our glasses are perfectly crystal clear and that we are certain we know what's going on. We don't, we don't know what's going on. That I think what kind of lulls us into believing we do is the more similar, like just on the, on the um, demographic space, the more similar we appear, or you sense that this should be interpreted well, or you could interpret it, um, the more we believe that we're, we're right. We, we did a study a, a quite a while back, and it was actually tougher for Anglos going to Anglo cultures than it was for Anglos going to non-Anglo cultures in terms of adjusting to being in that new context, in part because you kind of think it's easy when you're you know, America going to the UK, Canadian going to Australia, where whatever it might be. And then, so the, the subtle differences seem like, well, where did that come from? Well, there's differences. Whereas when you know you're in a different, like you were in Japan, you, you're kind of willing to say, okay, I can sense it, I can feel it. Uh, I, you know, I'm sensing my skin here. I, I can, um, I, I respect the fact that I'm in a, a place that I don't fully understand. So it's interesting. We we kind of get lulled into believing that we're we're good at this. Yeah. Well, and everything that looks different around us, we expect things to be different. Right. But when things look, you know, pretty much the way they we would expect them to look, then we expect them to fit our um, our, our view of the world. I guess would be a, a way to say it, or our what our what we would exp our norms. True statement. Yeah. Absolutely. But but again, I kind of go back to the. There are, there are just a set of things we can be doing to start moving the needle on our cultural agility. Um, one of the things we do with Skillify is we have a free tool. It's absolute for all of your, all of your viewers um, who are interested. It's called My Guide, M-Y-G-I-I-D-E. So the idea of you know, seeing eye to eye. And you can go in and assess your own cultural values relative to those of different cultures. What's a really interesting first exercise is comparing yourself to the default, if you will, of your home country. And because you can just right away say, wait a minute, of course, no one is the stereotype that they're in. Everybody's a little, you know, of course we're different. Um, so that's kind of a nice first a first exercise. And then start looking at, you know, how things differ in different countries or could differ. 
And I do have your contact information in the in the, the description on both LinkedIn and in YouTube, and it'll be in the podcast. We'll go ahead and put the link. You have a link to download the guide. Yeah, yeah, with my and guide. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And anyone, anyone's welcome to go on it. You can also assess your cultural competencies, those cultural agility competencies for free. Um, yeah, we were set up as a public benefit corporation for a reason. We want to make sure everyone can benefit. Okay, so we'll, I'll make sure that that link is available so everybody can find it and Please. do that. Um, and we'll also put a link to your book. Uh, we'll talk about your book in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. Because you do have a book, right? I do. do book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, and we will share a link to the book as well. So let me go back to questions. So do you learn cultural agility from traveling to different countries? I wish. <laughs> oh, can I wish? So, you know, it's so, it's so funny whenever I hear, um, like organizations say, you know, we're, you know, so-and-so spent, you know, this much time in 47 countries. And I'm thinking it, it, it's like, you don't just get on an airplane, get off an airplane in another country. And all of a sudden you breathe the air of that country and, you know, fairy dust drops over you and you become culturally edge up. It's not that easy. It's the nature and quality of the, of the, um, of the experience that you have while you're in that context. It's the extent to which you've allowed yourself to have your assumptions questioned, the ability to slow down your processing and learn from those in the environment about how to, to operate differently. You can absolutely build cultural agility through travel, through short, ex short experiences, through interactions with people from other cultures, but just because you travel doesn't mean you've built cultural agility and you we really for companies, any any corporate leader out there, please be careful that you default to passport stamps or expat experience as a proxy for cultural agility. It's not. Um, similar when I hear organizations, universities talk about, oh, we've got, you know, people here from 120 countries. That also is not cultural agility. Cultural agility happens when they start collaborating, communicating, and trusting, and befriending, and, and feel a sense of belonging when they're together and see themselves, um, you know, it's, it's certainly different and have different backgrounds, but, but connected. So, so those are the two I'm out there, I'm out there pushing pretty hard against some, some myths, and, and one of them is the myth of diversity and then that myth of um, travel. Yeah. And I can see that it was because it was interesting when my wife and I lived in Japan and this, I think goes to, to the same thing is we lived off base on the economy in a, a Japanese neighborhood. And we had, we developed, I don't want to say friendships because our language was never good enough to really become what you would say friends, but we, you know, it was hi and how are you? And, you know, and you, it just always saying hi to people and just being pleasant with them. And, we had a great time on Japan. We loved our experience there. And there were people that were there at the same time that never left the base and and absolutely hated it. And I'm like, you know, you, you gotta get out and meet people and understand because it was we, we if we went to a restaurant, we would typically go to a Japanese, you know, like a typical Japanese restaurant, to a noodle house, for example. And a lot of times our ordering was point at a <laughs> picture on the menu. You know. Uh, my wife learned to read a little bit and I learned, I learned a few words and it was, it's amazing what a few words in any language does to, um, kind of, like I said, kind of break down the barrier a little bit, you know, you show a little bit of respect and, and that, I think that maybe is where all of this stems from to some extent is respecting the other person for who they are, where they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I, absolutely. I think we see the same thing. Military bases, it happens, um, expat housing. So sometimes I've heard executives sort of be really quite proud of the fact that they have very little exposure to the country that they're in. They live in expat housing, they hang out with compatriots or other people quite like them. Um, they go to their corporate headquarters that they run or are you know pretty senior in. So they, they don't really have much of a, of a multicultural experience Again, breathing the air of another country is not the same as building cultural agility, having a more authentic experience, the ability to question, test your assumptions, understand the limits of your knowledge, you know, work collaborative, collaboratively with peers from a different culture. That's when it starts to build. Okay, so let me ask a question. And this kind of goes back to what we talked a little bit earlier 
then how does cultural agility relate to unconscious bias? Yeah. So can unconscious bias, and, and I, I appreciate the spirit that, from which the unconscious bias training movement kind of was built. Um, the idea of if we make people aware of, uh, you know, the way our brains function, they'll kind of stop it, right? They, you know, you, <laughs> they'll, they won't rely on sort of their first reaction or they'll process the fact that their, that their subjective response is not necessarily something that they're controlling. I appreciate that spirit. What I get very nervous about is the fact that that's it, that that's what we're doing. And then we're telling people all the behaviors they need to do in order to not process. Well, you can't turn off that processor. And so by, by kind of highlighting all the different ways your, your brain is, you know, you mentioned the broken glasses, your brain has those broken glasses. All you're doing is kind of pointing out the cracks in the glasses. What we want to do is say, hey, look at everybody's got them as you did with your sister in that one example, um, which is the cultural agility piece. But more so than that is that there's this set of competencies that we can build that make all the unconscious bias training stuff go away. Tolerance of ambiguity, humility, perspective taking, the ability to build relationships. There's, there are core competencies that when, when individuals have a, a reasonably decent level of these competencies, none of the unconscious bias stuff doesn't matter. They can get put themselves into any multicultural context and be present and, and be in that situation with humility and, and you know, longer deliberation, longer, you know, pauses for judgment. It, it's just a part of who they are as, as culturally agile professionals. So that, that's that's actually why I, I, I wish, I, like I said, that time, the money spent on unconscious bias training, I wish it would stop and just re, you know, kind of reinvest um, at least the time in, in the, the cultural agility training and be doing so much better. You know, and it's interesting is I think so many of the things that you talk about in association uh, with cultural agility are, yeah, let's just call it in some ways, they're basic people skills. <laughs> they, 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 even if somebody's of the exact same cultural everything that you are, their glasses are still going to be broken a little different. And I think that if you can develop those qualities, it'll make you a better leader, a better manager. Uh, more skillful in, in, in so many areas in business, if you, uh, humility is huge. Uh, too many times our pride gets in, in the way of success. Our pride gets in the way of a lot of things. It damages relationships. The ability to connect with people that you work with and you, that work for you and that you work for, all of those, to me, are, are vital keys to building winning organizations, winning teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> All, all around, these are these are fundamental people skills, great leadership skills. The class I teach, my MBA class, is called uh, "Becoming a Global Leader," and I always joke with my students. I, I say, "Look, it's the most pretentiously named class you'll ever take in your MBA program." <laughs> but the idea is that we focus on the competencies necessary to lead. The challenge that a lot of individuals have is that they can execute on those competencies relatively easily when they're not in a novel environment, when the situation is interpretable, when they can kind of predict the way people will react because there's a lot of individuals with similar socializing, you know, lifestyles, backgrounds, socializing agents behind them. It's when situations are, people are coming from different, different lenses, different experiences, different generations, different socioeconomic status, different religions, different, now you start to layer it on and are we, it's a little less predictable, but we say, hey, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm humble and this and that. It's like, well, you are, but you need to learn how to do that in a, in a multicultural context. So it's, it's really the idea of that. It, it's how you respond in that novelty, in that context that's, that's different from your home. Okay, well, that's, that, that's been very insightful. I appreciate that. And I, I, can, I can find areas in myself that, that I could become probably more culturally agile than I am. I think it's uh, for, every, for everybody in the audience, I think that it's one of those things that if you want, again, and this is all about becoming, uh, you, you talk about a, a global leader and it's about developing the skills you need to be an effective leader. You know, I, I tell the, um, 
the students in the class that I teach, when we start, when we're talking about leadership, I, I, you think about a leader, what does a leader have to have? He has to have people that want to follow him. And you can make people do things, but that doesn't make you a leader. It just makes you a boss or a manager. You know, somebody that's really effective as a leader can deal with people in a way that um, he shows his interest. In, and I tell him that a lot of times, I love this expression, it's uh, people don't care how much they know, you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, right. right. And, and so when you show that kind of um, attitude toward the people that you're working with and toward your team, they start to want to follow you. And it becomes so much easier to lead them. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think cultural agility is a huge piece of that. Absolutely. And it, and actually, and then learning the behaviors of how to show you care. Because in some cultures, let me give you a really simple example. In some cultures, um, inquiring about health, about children's welfare, about their, you know, education, about all the like things that you think are we're just showing that we care, um, can be viewed very paternalistically, a little bit intrusive, could be. So, so it's, it's, it's understanding those competencies, but then understanding how to execute them in the context that you're in um, and to do so effectively. So that, that idea, you know, show that you care. I, I love it because it is so true. Just remember that everybody's going to like perceive care very differently. Yeah. So, so that's one of those cases that you really need to be aware of the cultural differences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And likewise with humility, you know, how you show humility in a, in a leadership context in particular um, some ways of showing humility could be asking for lots of feedback or lots of opinions and this and that. And, and so from, from an egalitarian lens like the United States tends to be, that can be viewed very, very positively um, in a more hierarchical structure. It can be viewed quite negatively. Like, wh what do you mean? This leader doesn't know what, <laughs> what they're doing. So you have, to be, you have to be a little more subtle with, uh, you know, leading first and then filling in the, the, the points where, um, context is needed and, and the humility kicks in in the way that the, that it doesn't question one's credibility. So each of these have a little bit of a um, kind of like, you know, here's the headline, but then the details are a little bit more challenging. That's why we do both with, uh, with that tool. We, we do both the competency side, where your competency is, but then what are the skills, what are the behaviors you need in order to operate in that environment? Yeah. Very nice. I, I have enjoyed our conversation. Uh, one, one last little thing that was I learned, and this I think would fall in the cultural realm. In Japan, did you know it matters what you do with your chopped sticks after you eat? Most don't people eat them. Yeah, you don't stab them. That's death to the cook. If you just put them <laughs> off to the side, it's like the meal is just okay. If their tips are touching on the plate, then it's like you enjoyed the meal. Oh, yep. that's interesting. No, I didn't know that one. So, so the, you, you lay it on the plate with the tips touching? Yeah, and, and, and so all of these things, you know, and, and those are very simple things. But again, when we're talking about uh, being aware of the culture, you can do something that would be very offensive. I, I know a, a good example is in some lands, uh, pointing is, you know, or putting the bottom of your feet towards somebody or pointing your toe at somebody, all of these little things. And so it behoves all of us when we're traveling to have at least a little bit of idea about where, you know, the people are going to be around. So if, if you're traveling for work and you're going to a foreign, a foreign country, I would say that it would behoove you to find somebody that's, uh, that has some experience and, and show your humility and say, what are the things that I need to think about as, as I'm here? How do I, how do I master the trait of, of coming across as being, let's say, culturally sensitive and humble, but not put my foot, you know, way into my mouth kind of thing. So can we give all kinds of advice like that for free on the website? So, so I really, I think if your if your listeners, if your viewers are excited about this topic or interested in this topic or curious about this topic or have a meeting in a week with someone from another culture, if you go onto the site and, and just play around with it, you'll be given lots of great advice. Okay. And I want to highlight a comment. We did get a comment. So do that. We'll pop it up. Nice to have you with us, uh, St uh, Stephen. Um, I uh, appreciate your comment there. I, I'm here to learn as well. Um, Paul is a good teacher. Maybe that's why she has a, a class in the university. <laughs> okay. Anyway, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Um, and I think it's time we've uh, pretty much uh, covered our subject. So we'll say goodbye to the audience. Paul, if you'll hang around for just a second afterwards. Sure. But for everybody, like I said, uh, 
Paul's contact information will be in the in the documentation associated with wherever you're watching the video or listening to it. If you're watching it on YouTube and haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I'd really appreciate it if you did. If you're on LinkedIn and you haven't followed my page, I'd appreciate it. Um, like I said, reach out to Paula. She's got some good resources for you. And all of this information will be where you can find it. We really appreciate you being with us. And thank you so much, Paula, for saying and being here on the show today. I've enjoyed our conversation immensely. Oh, my pleasure, Ken. Thanks for the invitation.